Okay, so welcome again to the first lecture on finite element uh, for multiphysics. Today's topic is the finite element method. And after explaining a few prerequisites, you should have heard in uh, previous courses, we'll go through the formulation of the strong and weak form of a partial differential equation, which is the basis for any finite element uh, formulation. And then we go in through into the finite element procedure uh, handling the discretization, the definition of shape functions, and the Galerkin procedure, which will allow us to obtain um, a discretized form of our problem. And finally, I'll note a little bit about the numeric implementation for, of the finite element method, uh, being the reference element concept, and a few notes on numerical integration. Uh, however, this is not the central part of this course. Okay, so what should you know already? Basics of linear algebra, basics of numerical methods, and calculus. Um, the notation used in these slides uh, is uh, kept consistent as much as possible. Uh, we use lower symbols, uh, bold lower symbols for either physical or algebraic vectors. So u, for example, for uh, the displacement or x for the position. If we have an exponent t, it means the vector or ma matrix transpose. If we have bold symbols that are capital letters, these are tensors or matrices. And volume regions are denoted by capital omega. Uh, closed surface regions enclosing a domain omega are denoted by delta omega or partial omega, and surface regions are denoted by gamma. Okay, so the first calculus thing you should already know is the gradient operator. And here we donate it by the Nabla operator. Uh, so if we have a scalar function phi, uh, Nabla phi is the gradient. And for Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z in 3D, for example, we have here the gradient operator, which simply is a vector of the partial derivatives with respect to the spatial coordinates, x, y, and z. So we can write gradient phi as the partial derivative of phi with respect to x, y, and z, and obtain the gradient vector. So the gradient of a scalar field is a vector field. The second thing you already should know is uh, the inner product. And uh, we define here the inner product between two vectors we denoted by a central dot between them. So u dot v is denoting the inner product between the vectors u and v. And again, here the example for Cartesian coordinates, we have u in v, uh, which is simply the sum of all the component products. The second thing is the divergence. Uh, and the divergence of a vector field is expressed by the inner product of the Nabla operator and a vector field. So you can write the divergence as Nabla in U. And again, in Cartesian coordinates, this gives you then a scalar, which is built by building the sum of the uh, partial derivative with respect to the coordinates again. Uh, the last thing of the prerequisites we require for this lecture is the divergence theorem. So if you have a vector field u on a domain omega, bounded by a closed surface delta omega. We know that the, the volume integral of the divergence of this vector field is equal to the surface integral of the vector field times the normal vector integrated over the boundary of our domain omega. The divergence theorem is also called Gauss theorem, and in a it is a special case of Stokes theorem. This is uh, often used synonymously in this context. So 
what is to note is that u in n is actually the normal flux over the boundary. Okay, so you can apply the divergence theorem. I will not go into this example since we will see it later applied to our example PDE. Uh, so let's go uh, into defining the weak form. And what we need for, for a start is we need to consider which domain we consider. Um, here we have denoted our generalized domain potato here, could be any shape uh, with the letter omega, and it has boundaries, uh, and the total boundary is made up here given by two parts, gamma d and gamma n, where we will apply different boundary conditions, and every boundary point has a normal vector denoted by n. Um, if we now look in the strong form of a PDE, we have a partial di differential e equation given uh, here is equation one. This is the Laplace equation. It's defined on our complete domain omega. And as you can see, it has differential operators involved. It has the divergence of the gradient of our field variable u and x denotes the position in space. So x is a point in omega. What we also need to complete the problem is boundary conditions and they can be in a very general um, form. Uh, they can be written for example as a function uh, of the normal derivatives or of the function itself equals some known values. So qi at position x are known values. And we search for the solution u of x. So just as a side note, the in inhomogeneous version of this equation is called the Poisson equation. Okay, so now we have our Strong form, what we also need is boundary conditions and they can be formulated in different ways. Uh, the first way to formulate the boundary condition is a Dirichlet type condition. Uh, what we do here is we specify directly uh, the value of the unknown on the boundary. So this is also called an essential boundary condition uh, and it is uh, given here. Uh, the second important type of boundary condition is the Neumann boundary condition, where we actually specify the normal derivative or flux of the field on the boundary. So this can be denoted in several ways, either by the partial derivative of u uh, with respect to the normal vector. This is actually the same as normal vector in gradient of the field u. And again here we can specify the values that this normal flux should take on the boundary uh, and the values are denoted by qn. Note that n is always the outward facing normal vector. And then we can have a mixed case. Uh, this is called a Robin boundary conditions, uh, which is a linear combination between Dirichlet and Neumann type conditions. Um, and as a last note, both the uh, all all of these conditions can be either homogeneous, uh, which means they are equal to zero, or they can be inhomogeneous. Um, where the inhomogeneous place uh, case is the the more general one, and the homogeneous case can be uh, seen as a special case of it. So now when we go from the partial differential equation to the finite element solution, which is what we want to do uh, in this lecture, uh, is we have to take a few steps. Uh, the first step is we have to write our partial differential equation in the weak or variational form. Then we have to discretize our domain in finite elements. And finally, we have to apply Galerkin's method to obtain an algebraic system or a system of ordinary differential equations in time 
from, from, for our problem. And then finally, we have to solve this system numerically. And we will go through these steps now on an example PDE. So before we do this, just a few advantages of the finite element method. First of all, it's numerically efficient. So the discretization of the calculation of the, uh, of the calculation domain um, yields matrices that are sparse. Uh, so they, are, they, they don't require a lot of uh, storage in memory uh, and they can be solved in very um, efficient, numerically efficient algorithms. Um, the treatment of, of nonlinearities, for example, for nonlinear mechanics or for, for um, nonlinear magnetics are very well established uh, and well known. The method can also handle complex geometry in a very easy way. Um, and the method is, as you will later see, is suited for static, transient, harmonic, uh, and eigenvalue analysis. Uh, there are also some disadvantages of the finite element method. First of all, you have to discretize your domain, uh, which can be complex, especially in very complicated uh, 3D volume regions. Uh, so this subdivision into finite elements, you have to do. Um, and another uh, downside of the finite element method is uh, to handle open domain problems, since you can only compute uh, on everything you discretize, uh, but you can't discretize infinite finite space. Uh, this will give you a huge computational domain, of course, and this is not efficient anymore. Uh, but to handle this problem, there are some techniques like infinite elements that you can apply on the boundary or perfectly matched layers. These will be topics of finite element methods for multiphysics too. Okay, so let's derive the weak form of a partial differential equation. Uh, this is done always in the same three steps. So the first step is to introduce an appropriate test function. Then we multiply our PDE by this test function and integrate over the domain. And finally, you usually apply the divergence theorem and incorporate Neumann boundary conditions. Um, Again, as a side note, this weak form is also called the variational formulation of the problem. And from this weak form, we will we'll then derive the finite element procedure. So let's look at the weak form of our example PDE. Uh, we'll start with Laplace equation on the domain omega. Uh, and to be general, we use Dirichlet and Neumann conditions in the inhomogeneous form. Uh, so we have Laplace operator, meaning divergence of the gradient of u equals zero. Um, and we have on gamma e, the Dirichlet boundary condition, and on gamma n, the Neumann boundary conditions. So first step, we introduce a test function v, multiply with, with the PDE, and integrate over the domain. So this gives us uh, this first form. That was the easy step. The next step is to use the divergence theorem. So this is usually done by introducing the product rule for the divergence. And here you can recognize here in the last term, actually the term we had in the integral before. We had v times divergence of a vector valued function. So the vector valued function here is the f. Uh, and here the product rule for v times f is written in the general form. Uh, and this is the term we actually want to replace in the previous integral. And if we do this, we obtain the following form where we have the volume integral where suddenly the differential operator, the Laplace operator has been reduced to a gradient operator. Uh, so an operator of first order. Uh, from a second order operator and the test function gets a derivative, a differential operator too. Uh, and finally, we have another volume integral where we have the divergence of V times gradient U. Uh, and you can see already that here directly we can 
apply the divergence theorem. So if we do this, we get uh, the volume integral transforms into a boundary integral. And you can also recognize that in this boundary integral, we actually have the term that we have in our Neumann boundary condition, meaning n in gradient of u. So we can split the boundary integral into regions with Neumann and Dirichlet boundary conditions, uh, will, which will give us finally this form. And now the last step is that we handle the boundary conditions. Uh, and for this, we first assume that the test function at the Dirichlet boundary is zero. Uh, the argument for doing this is that we do not need to test the solution there because we already know it, it's given. And the second step is to insert the inhomogeneous Neumann boundary condition. Um, here we actually can insert the given values directly on gamma n. And if we do this, we get our final weak form, uh, which reads, find the unknown u of x satisfying our integral equation here for all test functions v of x. And actually the last part for all test functions v of x uh, is the important part. You will see it later when we apply the Galerkin procedure. Uh, just a few side notes on the incorporation of the boundary condition. You could see that the natural boundary conditions uh, are incorporated naturally into the boundary term. So this is exactly the boundary term that comes up by uh, the application of the divergence theory. And the essential boundary conditions, so the Dirichlet conditions, are enforced via the function space. Uh, so this is by assuming the test function is zero and on the other hand side setting the unknowns directly to the values that are required. Um, what is also important to see is that the order of the derivative of the unknown has been reduced. In the strong form we had a operator of second order, so the Laplace operator, and now we only have a gradient operator on u. Um, on the other hand side, we also need to differentiate our test function. Okay, so if we now have our finite element formulation being uh, a weak or a variational form, uh, we have to note that this is still a continuous problem. So u and v are continuous functions. Uh, and when you now use a Galerkin procedure, we can actually discretize this and derive an algebraic system of equations. And again, there are three steps to, to do this. The first step is we split our domain in small finite subdomains. These are the so-called finite elements. And on each of those elements, we introduce a local ansatz for the solution. So we will actually approximate our continuous solution by discrete unknowns, ui, uh, and some continuous ansatz functions or shape functions. And then we apply a lurking me method and we have our discretized system. Uh, the nice thing about this procedure is, is that it is highly uh, automatizable uh, and it is also equivalent for any PDE. So we'll do it once in detail now uh, and for all the different physics. Uh, the procedure will be the same. Okay, let's start with discretizing our domain. Again, we have here our domain potato uh, and I've split it up in triangular elements. So the area of one element here is denoted by omega m and m would be the index of the element number. And we could also have boundary elements. Uh, here is one uh, with the normal vector and the boundary element is called uh, gamma n uh, with the index m again of the boundary element index number. Uh, so when you do this, you can split the integrals, of course, in the integrals over the subregions. So you could make the complete integral over omega, uh, integral over all the individual subregions, and some 
these subregions. Uh, and of course, the same holds for the boundary integrals too. Uh, the next step is that we introduce discrete function spaces, so the continuous functions uh, u of x and t and v of x, they are approximated by discrete function spaces. So our unknowns are not the functions anymore, but they are unknown coefficients u, uh, uj and vi, for example. Um, and the continuous functions n of x, they are actually known functions and we know how to build the derivatives of them. Uh, note that these functions are always defined on the element level. Uh, we have our discrete uh, function spaces that we have introduced by introducing unknown coefficients uh, and known ansatz functions. So these shape functions, ansatz functions or interpolation or basis functions uh, are typically used synonymously in the context of finite element method. And the important point is that the ansatz is local to the element. Um, a few words on the properties of the basis functions. Typically, you use very simple functions like Lagrange polynomials, which are local to the element. Uh, and for example, defined on the element domain and zero everywhere else. Uh, and they have to be able to fulfill the essential boundary conditions. Um, typically, the type of basis functions defines the name of the element. For example, you use linear, element, uh, linear basis function, the element is called a linear element. Or you use quadratic basis function, the element is called a quadratic element. Um, a few notes on the most traditional finite elements that we'll use in this course. Uh, these are so-called nodal finite elements, uh, which are using nodal basis functions. Uh, and uh, the special properties there are, they take the value of one at the position of the associated node. So the unknown of node one has, uh, the, the unknown of node one, the corresponding basis function has the value of one at the position of the node one. Uh, and they are zero on all the other nodes of the element. Uh, additionally, uh, these function must have the following properties. They have to be smooth in the interior of the element domain. This is important since we need to uh, compute derivatives of the basis function as you have seen in the weak form. Uh, and they have to be continuous across element boundaries because we are actually looking for continuous uh, solutions of our PDE and they have to be complete. So they have to be able to uh, exactly represent a linear function. Um, and to make the definition of the interpolation functions as easy as possible, one defines them on a reference element. Uh, we'll see later how this works in detail. So, just an example, how do uh, shape functions for linear elements in 1D look like? So we have our domain, it's one, only one dimensional, uh, going from zero to six in X. Uh, and we have here one element, it's called omega two, so it's the second element. Uh, it has two nodes, node one and node three. And it has a basis function N1, it's the basis function for element two, you can see by the index, and it has a value of one at the associated node one, uh, and the, uh, correspondingly for, for the ansatz function for node two, you have uh, a value of one at the associated node, which is node three, and a value of zero at the other side. Um, so this is an example of these very simple head type functions uh, as ansatz functions. Often it's Lagrange polynomials. If you go to higher order, for example, the Lagrange polynomials tell you uh, how you have to um, increase the order, how the fu function looks then. Um, 
the delta property we have already mentioned, and the partition of unity. This property is basically equivalent to the um, condition of completeness we've uh, mentioned before. Uh, so here there is, is a, here is there is an example for the one-dimensional domain. If we have uh, again our 1D element going from 1 to 3, uh, I've given here the ansatz function for node working procedure in order to obtain our discretized system of equations. Uh, so this works for any variational formulation uh, just by the same uh, mechanics, so to say. Uh, and this is uh, again illustrated by the PDE we have from above. And the first step is to insert our ansatz into the weak form. Uh, we have to remember that we can split the integral over the, the, the complete domain in the integral over all our subdomains, uh, so the elements. Um, that's why we have the sums in here. Uh, and we have introduced our ansatz here for the test function and for the unknown function. And we've done the same for our boundary term here only for the ansatz function, of course, we have no test function there. So this was the first step that was easy, just insert what you have assumed. Uh, and the second step is then to uh, actually use the Galerkin procedure. Uh, now we can obtain a single equation by assuming that for node i, we have a value of vn equal one for this node and for all other nodes, uh, the vn is zero. So then uh, the sum terms drop and the uh, equation simplifies quite a lot. Um, and this was only one particular choice, but since our weak form actually has to hold for all possible test function, we can use, we, we can do this uh, as often as we want. Uh, and in particular, we will do it as often as we need to obtain a single equation for all the unknown, or one equation for every unknown we have assumed. So that's why it's important to, to note that the weak form has to hold for any test function. And then finally, there's only a rearrangement to be done. We have to consider that the coefficients actually are constant, so we can pull them out of the differential operators and only apply the differential operators to our known um, ansatz functions. Uh, and this gives us the final equation of the al algebraic system. Uh, so this is one line of the algebraic system. And now we see how the element matrices look like. Um, these sums we have seen before, so the sum over all the elements, uh, they will make up the total system matrix. Uh, and if we only consider the sum over one element, uh, we have terms like this. It is easy to write the sums uh, is matrix notation. So you have element stiffness matrix in this case uh, times the vector of element unknowns is equal to the right hand side on the element le level, uh, the element forcing vector. Um, for our particular PDE, you can see how the entries of the element stiffness matrix are made up. You need the differential operator on the ansatz functions and for the right hand side. So for the forcing vector, for example, for a boundary element, uh, we have only the ansatz function times our known functions to build the element uh, of the element forcing vector. Uh, and to compute this expression, you see we have to integrate over uh, the volume of the element or on the over the boundary surface. 
uh, and this integration will be done numerically. Uh, just as an example, the stiffness matrix entry uh, for, for uh, our PDE for a 2D problem uh, is given here. So we only have a position coordinate uh, that has two coordinate components, X and Y. The gradient operator is then also uh, two components large. Uh, and we can write out the expressions from before. Uh, so if we write out the inner product between uh, of, of gradient n i times gradient n j, we get the following expression. And what you see here is actually this expression is symmetric. So it doesn't matter if we have k i j or k j i, uh, since the sum is symmetric uh, and the product is symmetric, we have a symmetric uh, stiffness matrix. So if we have three nodes, our element stiffness matrix has three times three elements, but is symmetric. So a few important observations from this procedure. Um, first, continuity is ensured by selecting the nodal degrees of freedom in each element from a global vector of degrees of freedom. So if we have two adjacent elements uh, and they share nodes, these um, Coefficients are not double, they just are picked from a global vector uh, of degrees of freedom. Second, we need to integrate expressions containing the basis functions and the derivatives over the element domain. So these integrals, uh, we still have to find out how to actually compute those. Um, and another observation is the entries of the global stiffness matrix are composed of contributions of several elements. So wherever two elements uh, are adjacent, where they have picked uh, the same degrees of freedom, uh, they there are uh, contributions in the global stiffness matrix from the two elements. Uh, however, due to the locality of the basis function, since they're zero everywhere else outside the elements, the contributions only come from neighboring elements. Uh, so in total, our stiffness matrix, matrices will be rather sparse and contain a lot of zeros. Um, now, so now we'll go into the numeric implementation and in particular see a little bit how the numerical integration over the element is done. Uh, so the arising integrals are evaluated numerically for example, by using Gauss quadratio. Um, so this is done for every expression. So for the stiffness matrix and for the boundary terms, which will result in the loading vector, for example, uh, the integration is done on the element level only. And the result, results are then assembled into the global system matrix. So this is the sum you've seen in the Galerkin procedure. The first sum over all the elements, this is in essentially the assembly process. Um, and again, this integration um, must be defined for each element. So how is this done in practice? One uses the reference element concept. And this simplifies two things first, uh, it simplifies the definition of basis functions. Uh, we define the basis function simply on the reference element and then map this to the actual configuration of the element in the physical space. So our reference element is defined in the unit space uh, and mapped to physical space. Uh, and it also simplifies the determination of integration boundaries. For example, if you consider one element in physical space uh, and at, this has certain integration boundaries that are not, not easy to define already in 2D. Uh, however, you would need to do this definition uh, for every differently shaped element um, again. Uh, whereas in unit space, you always have the same boundaries from minus one to one. Uh, in xi, xi direction and for the eta direction the same. Um, so this is much simpler there. Uh, so how do these mapping uh, and ansatz functions look like? First, we can write them in, um, in matrix notation. 
um, and it's actually done very similarly to the ansatz function for the unknown. We assume our position x is made up by unknown coefficients, so xn times uh, a set of basis functions mn, and these basis functions are defined in the reference space. Um, and these unknowns, they're actually not unknowns, uh, they are actually our nodal coordinates. So we know those. Uh, so this is how we can define the extent of the element in physical space, x. Um, and additionally, we can also define our solution ansatz now, uh, not as a function of physical space x, but a function of the reference space xi, since we know how we can map from xi to x. So this is basically equivalent, but it makes the definition of our differential operators a little bit easy, easier. Okay, and if we now choose our, this is a particular choice, our mapping functions m of xi equal to our ansatz function n of xi, we actually obtain the so-called isoparametric Elements. So these are elements that use the same mapping uh, and ansatz functions. However, they don't have to be the same. You can also use uh, elements that are not isoparametric. However, isoparametric elements are uh, the most frequent choice. Uh, note also that the ansatz for this geometry mapping is in fact equivalent to the finite element ansatz we have done before. Uh, so here, there's an example for the linear interpolation functions for this 1D reference element we have seen before. Uh, we have the reference element uh, at coordinates, it starts from minus one and goes to one. Uh, then we can build the ansatz functions here. They're simply given uh, as the unknowns times our mapping functions, uh, our, our ansatz functions now in uh, the reference coordinate xi. Uh, here is how you can define the, the ansatz function n, uh, where xi i is actually given here at the start. These are the nodal coordinates. Um, and then you can obtain the ansatz function by simply inserting. Uh, we see that this is a linear function and that it actually takes the nodal values of one if you have the nodal coordinate uh, and so zero if not. Um, then there's again the example given here. I think I will not go into detail. Uh, it's uh, a nice uh, illustrative example if you actually uh, draw the functions um, on a sketch and see how they look like and you can also see um, how easy it is to define uh, the integration boundaries uh, with this mapping concept. Um, one complication, so to say, that comes with the mapping concept is uh, that we have done a change in coordinates, so to say. Um, we have to adapt the integration limits. They have to be defined in physical space. However, we're operating in our reference space and we can also we also have to adapt uh, the volume and uh, boundary elements so the differential elements uh, change when you do a change in coordinates and integrals you might uh, remember this uh, from, from your mathematics courses um, and you can you also have to define the differential operator with respect to the new variables and this is typically done by the so-called Jacobian matrix. So what the Jacobian matrix is usually written as, uh, it's written as the partial derivative of uh, the original, so the physical coordinates with respect to the reference coordinates. Um, so now we also denote our differential operator, the gradient operator uh, in reference coordinates is gradient xi uh, and the gradient operator in uh, physical coordinates is gradient x um, and the Jacobian is usually denoted by capital J. 
what we see, we actually need this gradient x. That's what we have in our physical formulation. Uh, so we will see we need to invert the Jacobian to actually obtain this. Uh, and again, the determinant of the Jacobian uh, is giving us uh, the um, respective uh, volume element uh, mapping between the reference and the um, and the physical configuration. So if we introduce this mapping into our uh, element stiffness matrix expression, uh, we see that the differential operator uh, is um, transformed by the inverse of the Jacobian and now the differential operator in um, the reference coordinates, which is nice because we have to actually apply it to our ansatz functions that are uh, defined in reference coordinates. And again, the volume element changes as given above. Uh, here is an example uh, for a 1D integral. Uh, this you might again remember from your mathematics course. If we have a definite integral uh, of the function f on x uh, integrated from x1 to x2, what you have to do um, when you do a change in coordinates that is given by a certain mapping x equals x of xi, is you have to first transform the integrand. So you in insert the mapping here. You have to compute how um, the, the um, area element, or so to say, the differential uh, changes. So this is uh, equivalent to the determinant of the Jacobian uh, in, in more dimensions. And you have to change the integration boundaries. Um, so these are the steps you have to take, uh, and this is equivalent in more dimensions if, as, as was shown before. Um, here there is an example for transforming the 2D differential operator. Uh, so we have our geometry mapping given uh, in two dimensions. So Xi, um, capital Xi is, uh, has two co coordinates, X has two coordinates. Um, we have our mapping function. Um, and if we now uh, do the partial dif differentiate uh, of uh, the function here, we can insert the mapping uh, and you see what expressions uh, you will, will get. If you want uh, the derivative with respect uh, to Xi, you have to apply the chain rule. First, uh, compute the der derivative with respect to X. Uh, and then the derivative of the mapping, so x with respect to xi, uh, and you have to do the same with the second variable y, uh, and for eta, uh, eta this is the same, and this you can write in matrix notation, and then you obtain uh, the notation uh, I've given before, so you have the differential operator with respect to the uh, reference coordinates xi, so gradient xi applied to f uh, is equal a Jacobian matrix, which contains the partial derivatives uh, of the mapping and uh, a gradient operator in the original coordinates x and y um, applied to f. So this is uh, written out for, for the 2D case. Of course, this directly extends to the 3D case. Okay, so let's uh, rehearse a bit the properties of the Jacobian. Uh, it contains the derivatives of the mapping functions. Uh, and you should note that it actually depends on the location of the nodes, because the mapping functions uh, depend on the nodal coordinates. Uh, the numerical value is, the, the numerical value of the Jacobian is a function of the local coordinates. So you can evaluate this Jacobian at every point in the element and it might have a different, or it will have in general, um, a different value everywhere. Um, and the Jacobian must be invertible. Uh, you've seen this uh, in the uh, integral we have derived um, at all integration points where, which are the locations where we have to 
evaluate. Um, if the Jacobian gets singular, uh, the mapping is non-unique. Uh, so this will be a problem. For example, if you do nonlinear analysis uh, of mechanical structures and you have large element deformations, your Jacobians might be um, singular. Uh, also a side note, the Jacobian defines how the differential operators are transformed. Uh, and its determinant gives the change in line, area, or volume element. Um, so now we're ready to do the numerical integration. And this is uh, typically done by Gauss integration. Uh, so we evaluate our linear and bilinear forms, so the integrals we have encountered, uh, by uh, approximating the continuous integral uh, by a sum. And the sum uh, of is of done of known weights and the evaluated functions at certain locations x k. Uh, so these locations x k, where we actually evaluate the functions, are called the integration points. Uh, the omega k are the associated weighting factors or weights, uh, and the number of integration points uh, we use in the element is usually called the integration order. Uh, there exist uh, different uh, rules to do this numerical integration and depending on the rules you get uh, different locations of the integration points and associated weights. Uh, just a few examples, you could do trapezoidal rule, you could do Simpson's rule, you could do Gauss quadrature, uh, or Lobato quadrature, uh, but they are more than, than given here. So let's, let's see how the integration is done on the reference element. Uh, the nice thing about this reference element now is we integrate over the whole element uh, volume, uh, and we already know the integration boundaries for the 2D element. It's easy, we have to integrate from minus one to one in psi direction and minus one to one in either direction. Uh, and again, we have the integrand here and we need the determinant of the Jacobian. Um, and we, if we replace this uh, integral uh, by a number of integration points, uh, we obtain uh, the sum here. Uh, actually note that this should be not an equal sign, but an approximate sign since the numerical integration typically is an approximation course. Uh, what we see here is that we have to evaluate the integrand at the integration point. So here we have to do the evaluation. Um, for boundary integrals, uh, these are surface integrals if we consider 3D elements or line integrals if we have 2D elements. Um, and the evaluation needs a parameterization of the geometry. Uh, so again, they are done um, on the element level. Um, there is um, a question on why we use the determinant here. The determinant uh, we have to use uh, since this is the transformation of the volume element. So the volume element d omega x transformed into our mapping space uh, contains the determinant of the Jacobian. Um, maybe uh, a, an example uh, that, that uh, sort of answers this question for, for surf surface integrals uh, for boundaries in 3D. Um, we need to parameterize the uh, boundary surface in 3D now by two coordinates. Since it's a 2D surface bounding uh, the, the 3D object, uh, it can be parameterized by, by two coordinates. Um, and then the area element can be given uh, by this expression. So you take uh, the mapping, uh, so, or, or you take the, the points x, uh, with, uh, with uh, the partial derivative with respect to the first uh, mapping coordinate and the second mapping coordinate, you do the uh, outer product, so the x product, uh, 
between these, these reference vectors, so to say, um, and this gives you the area element. Um, so then I've given here how a surface integral will transform uh, and again, again, instead of the determinant of the Jacobian, uh, which gives you uh, the mapping of uh, the volume element, you need this X product. Uh, just to illustrate this a little bit, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a sketch. I usually do this on the blackboard, which is not uh, possible at the moment. Uh, these partial derivatives are in fact the surface tangent vectors in the directions of the uh, parameterization of the surface, so um, xi and eta, um, and the pro cross product of these both tangent vectors is a surface normal vector and its absolute values gives you the area of the associated surface element. Um, and a side note, this area element can also be obtained uh, from the determinant of the so-called metric tensor of this surface mapping that was introduced at the start to define the surface in terms of the two surface coordinates. Um, for 2D, uh, it's a little bit easier since um, the uh, surface degenerates uh, to a line. So we have 2D um, volume. So the volume region is a 2D region uh, bounded by lines, so 1D elements, so the mapping is actually uh, one dimensional. The position uh, in two dimensions can be described by a single one dimensional uh, differential line element. Uh, so here you have now the expression you have seen um, uh, that is very similar already uh, to the 1D um, transformation of coordinate examples I've given. In the, at the start. So here is the expression uh, of for, for line integrals. Uh, and this already brings me to the summary of the finite element method. Uh, just to repeat the most important points from today, um, we have a general PDE uh, and in order to obtain its weak formulation, we multiply it by a test function, integrate over the whole uh, domain, um, and then we use the divergence theorem uh, on the highest spatial derivative, which enables us to include the boundary conditions. So then we have obtained our variational formulation and then we do the finite element procedure. So we assume simple element local ansatz functions um, to apply the Galerkin's method and this Galerkin's method directly yields uh, a discretized system. So either um, a discretized, uh, a completely discretized system, uh, a linear system for unknown coefficient, or a coupled system of ordinary differential equations in time. Uh, time we haven't handled yet, uh, but this will come in the next lecture a bit more explicitly. Uh, and we've also seen that the reference element concept greatly simplifies the definition of basis functions and boundaries for the numerical integration. So this is the method of choice to actually do the numerical computations. So this was all on the finite element method. Uh, with this, I thank you for your attention. Uh, I will cut the recording.